Hey, welcome everyone. This video will introduce us to the intra-aortic balloon pump as well as the aortic pressure curve that is associated with it. Now, while several forms of mechanical hemodynamic support exist, the balloon pump has easily become the most popular and we'll go over the really important concepts to know about the pumps. And likewise, knowing the aortic pressure curve associated with these devices can have vast implications, which many of you who work in the cardiac ICU setting already know. And here we have an image of a balloon pump properly positioned in the descending aorta. This is a polyethylene balloon mounted on a catheter. And hopefully you can see the tip, which comes close to the subclavian artery within about two centimeters of the left subclavian artery. Now the essential thing to know, the very least you should know about these pumps is the following. In diastole, the balloon inflates and that causes increased retrograde blood flow with a subsequent increase in blood flow to the coronary arteries. And in systole, the balloon deflates and the result of this is decreased afterload. Those are two very important things to know. So in diastole, the balloon inflates causing increased retrograde flow and thus increased blood flow to the coronaries and in systole the balloon deflates, afterload is decreased, and forward blood flow increases. And why is all this important? It's important because these actions combine to decrease myocardial oxygen demand and increase myocardial oxygen supply. Intraortic balloon pump therapy is often referred to as counterpulsation, which seems appropriately termed because the balloon inflates during diastole when the heart is relaxing, and in contrast, the balloon deflates during systole when the heart is contracting. IABP counterpulsation increases cardiac output, and what is all this going to do in terms of symptoms? Well, if a patient is having angina, they'll often have some alleviation of chest pain or other anginal equivalents. And also the signs and symptoms of cardiogenic shock improve. Balloon pumps have several indications for clinical use. Uh, cardiogenic shock, very common, intractable angina, low cardiac output after cabbage, and several others. So that's knowing what they are and why they're helpful. And now let's turn to the arterial waveform. And in, uh, in this case, it's known as the aortic pressure curve because we have a transducer in the aorta where the balloon pump is. So letter A denotes the peak systolic pressure in the aorta. And what is that in the average adult? Well, it's about 120 millimeters of mercury, right? But now that's not so much the case in cardiogenic shock. Next is the dichrotic notch, and this represents sudden closure of the aortic valve. And I always picture this as a rebound effect. So the blood in the aorta wants to go to the lesser pressure. So it will go retrograde and try to get back into the left ventricle. But the aortic valve prevents that from happening by closing. And that blood that tried to go backwards and back into the LV rebounds off the valve as it closes and again goes forward and that will give you the dichrotic notch, just a momentary elevated rebound in the pressure reading and it's often called a sawtooth pattern. Once again, that blood bounces off the aortic valve and it gives you just a momentary increase in the pressure reading. And letter C represents diastole when the heart is relaxing. So the waveform is at its lowest point. Normal healthy adult, this would be about 80. In cardiogenic shock, it's quite a bit lower. So this diagram shows us the entire cardiac cycle and where the aortic pressure curve fits in relation to everything else. So everything goes back to the diagram here that we've all seen before at one point or another. And I strongly recommend that each of us draw this from scratch and make sure that we know we can. And I bet most of us would encounter some difficulty in trying to do so. And that's why I highly recommend it. Okay, so once we understand the normal aortic pressure curve, we encounter the following scenario. Now, this is an aortic pressure curve in a patient that has a balloon pump with a 2 to 1 augmentation. It looks a little different from what we're used to seeing. So the first thing we can do to try and orient ourselves is to look at the bottom of the screen where we have our EKG strip. So here we can at least tell that we're dealing with four different beats. So now let's go ahead and start at the beginning of the tracing by the letter A. So this is unassisted systole, and here the aortic pressure curve is completely normal. But now remember, these patients are quite sick, so you're not going to see normal pressures of 120 millimeters of mercury like you would in a normal adult, but they'll be much lower. And next, we see the usual dichrotic notch, representing what? Closure of the aortic valve. And if you look close, you'll notice a slight difference between the first and third compared to the second and fourth beats. And what difference do you see? Exactly, the dichrotic notch of the assisted beat is slightly higher 
than the diacritic notch of the unassisted beats. During diastole, the balloon inflates and aortic pressure is increased. Importantly, aortic pressure is highest in diastole during augmentation. So we can see that here by the letter C. And the term for this is augmented diastolic pressure. So this causes increased retrograde blood flow and thereby increases blood flow to the coronary arteries. And here we see the letter D. This stands for end of diastole. So this is where the balloon deflates and causes the aortic pressure to drop quite suddenly. And you can see that we're going from one end of the spectrum to the other real quickly. So these are huge swings. And we've actually dropped further than we normally would have in diastole. So if you compare D to F, we're quite a bit lower here with the balloon pump deflating. And this is called the assisted end diastolic pressure. Not the LV end diastolic pressure, but rather it's the aortic end diastolic pressure. And this is going to be the pressure that the left ventricle is going to have to overcome for the aortic valve to open again. And if the assisted end diastolic pressure is lower than normal, which it sure is in this case, the ventricle doesn't have to work as hard to eject blood. So this reduces the heart's need for blood and oxygen or myocardial oxygen demand. And we have a decrease in afterload. So afterload is largely dependent upon aortic pressure. Now remember the law of Laplace. So we have tension, which essentially equals afterload, equals the pressure times the radius of the left ventricle divided by the wall thickness of the left ventricle. And always remember where we are in the cardiac cycle. So the assisted end diastolic pressure should be where exactly? So it's lower again, right? So it should be somewhere around there, and I have that circled. And here we have the peak aortic pressure of the unassisted beat. So notice that the peak is slightly lower than normal. So before we had that blue line, the peak systolic pressure reached that. Now we're a little bit lower. So this is also an effect of the balloon deflation. So since we started systole at a lower pressure, we end systole at a lower pressure. So we get a lower peak systolic aortic pressure. And what's quite remarkable about all of this is that even though we're at a lower peak systolic aortic pressure, the left ventricle can actually eject more blood even though it's not working as hard. So that's quite fascinating. And now we get to the diacritic notch of our unassisted beat. And here it occurs at a slightly lower aortic pressure than it did with the assisted beat. And this is simply due to the fact that our previous peak aortic pressure was lower. So since E was lower, B2 will be lower. And last we have diastole occurring with the unassisted beat. And here we have a higher aortic pressure with the unassisted than we did with the assisted beat. So again, in diastole, the balloon inflates and that causes increased retrograde blood flow with a subsequent increase in blood flow to the coronary arteries. And in systole, the balloon deflates and the result of this is decreased afterload. Two very important things to know. So a few very important things to remember. So there's four rules that you should know. Rule number one, the augmented diastolic pressure should be higher than the unassisted systolic pressure. Rule number two, the assisted systolic pressure should be lower than the unassisted systolic pressure. Rule number three, the assisted end diastolic pressure should be less than the unassisted end diastolic pressure. And finally, rule number four, the diacritic notch of the assisted beat should be slightly higher than the diacritic notch of the unassisted beat. So the curve in our example meets all four of those criteria. And indeed, in this patient, uh, the balloon pump was positioned properly. And essentially, our balloon was optimized. So I think in our next video, we'll go into some of the things that go wrong with the balloon pump. But for the purposes of this video, I just wanted to give you a brief introduction to intra-aortic balloon pumps and the aortic pressure curve that goes along with them. So thanks for joining me, and we'll, uh, we'll do this again next time. I uh, hope this was helpful. So long, goodbye.